Perfect, I think we can start. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, from the EU IUM Knowledge Management Hub, the Hub on Return Migration and Sustainable Reintegration. The conversation that we will have today is part of a set of webinars organized by the Knowledge Management Hub and aiming to present specific return and reintegration practices and tools, and to encourage knowledge and experience sharing. Today, we will present an important tool recently released by IUM, the Return Counseling Toolkit. This toolkit is a capacity building instrument aimed at providing a coherent and harmonized approach to return counseling based on migrant center principles that we will further be addressed by our speakers today. The aim of the toolkit is to address the capacity building needs of return counselors and to facilitate in a very practical way their work, as well as to strengthen the knowledge of the other stakeholders such as national, local authorities and civil society. So I quickly introduce myself. I am Francesco Giassi and I'm pleased to welcome you today to this webinar. I work as Knowledge Management Officer at the Knowledge Management Hub funded by the European Union and implemented by IUM through its protection division. So before we start, let me share with you some technical indications about this webinar. If you have any technical problem, please contact us at the email address you see on the screen. Please feel free to ask your question through the chat. They will be collected and addressed during the question and answer session after the speaker's presentation. And as a last point, this webinar will be recorded and made available in the return and reintegration platform. So we are very pleased to share with you today different voices and experiences on the return counseling. We will have Rose Borland, head of the IUM Return and Reintegration Unit at IUMHQ, who will help us to set the frame and share a few considerations, including on the relevance of the toolkit for the operationalization of return readmission and reintegration policies. Following our intervention, colleagues from the Western Balkans, Donatella Bradic, Migration Management Team Leader, and Alexander Jugovic, AVRR Protection Migrant Assistance, will tell us more about the tool and share best practices from its development and implementation. Colleagues from Save the Children and UNICEF, respectively Bogdan Krasic, Program Director of the Balkans Migration and Displacement Up, and Verena Gnaus, Global Lead of Migration Development at UNICEF, will tell us more about the upcoming module on, of the toolkit developed in partnership with the three organizations and focus on children. After these interventions with the help of Jamaica Scopa from the IUM Regional Office in Vienna, we will move to the interactive session where we will ask you, the panelists to address the questions that you will share with us throughout the webinar. We can now start our conversation and I'm very glad to give the floor to Rose Borland, Head of Return and Reintegration Unit. As you see from the screen, Rose has 18 years of international development years of international development experience. During her career, she specialized on issues related to the migrants' human rights, particularly on trafficking in persons and health, as well as return migration and reintegration. So let's start this brief journey around the return counseling toolkit. As mentioned, the toolkit also contributes to the operationalization of the IOMS policy on return, readmission and reintegration. And so please, Rose, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francesco, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's joining us. We're so pleased to have you with us now or those who will listen to the recording in the future. I have the honor to be here to set the stage a bit for this launch of this very important tool. So I have been asked to share a bit of information about our work globally on return and reintegration with our partners and our member states and to situate today's discussion in that international context. So I'm quite honored to be here and, and I'm very delighted you're joining us. So the first point that I would like to make is that return and reintegration are increasingly important to governments and other actors around the world who are setting policy. We've seen this, for example, in the dedicated objective within the Global Compact on Migration, Objective 21, that is a commitment of states to cooperate and to facilitate safe and dignified return as well as sustainable reintegration. Those of you who have been involved in the 
the GCM International Migration Review Forum. You will have seen this topic included in the progress circulation, but perhaps more importantly, we're seeing in the pledges that we're receiving in the GCM from countries, uh, a, a tendency to include return and reintegration. So again, the importance of the topic is, is high and it's now our responsibility within the UN system, including IOM as the UN Migration Agency, to contribute to these commitments, as well as those in the 2030 agenda that link to return, readmission, and reintegration. So within IOM's strategic planning and objectives, there's a few here that you can see. We really focus on the rights of the migrants and ensuring that their return is safe and dignified. And then the element of an informed decision to return voluntarily. And we're going to talk about that a bit more, and that links very closely to this tool that we're going to be discussing today. That includes supporting returnees at the individual level, but also work that is done to support their communities, structural systems, and the authorities, and looking at return and reintegration in ways that link to development priorities uh, and sustainable development uh, actions at the local level as well. Our work in IOM, for example, with our partners often includes technical support and advice, training, fostering dialogue and cooperation, and all of this again towards the rights-based approach to this continuum of return, readmission, and reintegration. But I think because of today's webinar, it's important to also talk about an evidence base. And part of what we do is that we are accountable to the people that we assist, to our member states, but also to the community that's working on these issues to learn from what we do and to do it better. So this evidence-based programming leads to this kind of global tool that we hope is useful not only for IOM, but for everyone who's working on this topic. This fits within the IOM global policy on the full spectrum of return, readmission, and reintegration, which has a holistic approach. It's again linked to a rights-based focus and it has different guiding principles. And again, it has this aim of safe and dignified return, readmission and sustainable reintegration. For today, what's worth highlighting is again that we want this process to be focused on the well-being and the rights of the people who are returning and that they are involved in every decision and process related to their return. So that migrant-centered focus is very important and their protection and well-being is central, but not as objects, not as people who are being moved around. There's an issue of their own leadership in their process, their own agency and decision-making to make an informed decision about participating in a voluntary return program or not. So that links us then to the tool that we're talking about today and the actions related to return counseling. And this is something that's been like IOM work and our partners work in return and reintegration for a very long time. Pre-departure information provision has been a part of this, but really looking to increase the agency of the migrants and the ownership of their decisions, ensuring that their rights are upheld, that we detect any vulnerabilities or needs that are to be addressed during the return process, during the reintegration to come, and preparing for safe travel and, and sustainable reintegration. That that requires a more comprehensive approach and a different kind of counseling. And that is the, the good practice that has been captured that you're going to hear more about today. So there's a link finally I want to emphasize between return counseling and sustainable reintegration. And this is linked to the way IOM and our partners approach um, reintegration and the fact that there is an integrated approach that has different dimensions. So when someone returns to their country, they look to reintegrate in different ways. And we, we talk about economic reintegration, social reintegration and psychosocial dimensions. But in addition to the support to that person as an individual in their household or family, we also have reintegration work at both the community and the structural level. And this again is that important link to systems and sustainable processes to ensure that this reintegration work continues as well as local priorities and community priorities. So when you are conducting return counseling, you are already preparing for reintegration and that link needs to start from that stage of pre-departure and decision-making. That includes the first steps towards a reintegration plan. It includes identifying needs and vulnerabilities and including them in your planning, such as the specific needs of certain family members, 
but it also means building on the strengths and the, the resilience factors that a person has that can facilitate their migration. So again, that agency to, to look at the person and not only address risks, but also protective factors as well. And finally, I would say it's very important, this sort of planning for reintegration, while it begins at the pre-departure stage, should never happen in one country without the link to the country of return. And one good practice that I can mention is remote counseling where counselors from the country of origin, from the country of return, are speaking to the potential returnee who are in Germany, for example, awaiting return. And that information about the real context, what is truly available, how the country has changed is, is critically important to return and reintegration. So I believe that I will stop there and hand back to you, Francesco. Thank you so much and congratulations everyone on this important tool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose, for setting the frame of our conversation and describe the policy context, the importance of the counseling, as well as strong link with the sustainable reintegration as part of its integrated approach. So the toolkit has a global perspective, although it also includes some specific focusing on the Western Balkans. And I'm glad now to give the floor to colleagues from the region uh, that we'll add more on the toolkit. So we start with Donatella Bradic. Donatella is specialized in migration management with focus on protection sensitive procedures in mixed migration flows. She has more than 25 years of experience in aid and development and an extensive expertise in border management practices. Donatella, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francesco. And thank you, Rose, for this introduction and giving us the setting the stage for dive a bit deeper into the uh, the toolkit itself. I also wanted to take the opportunity to uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, the Danish Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who has kindly uh, funded this uh, initiative in, uh, in our region. Anders is here and uh, uh, I am glad that he managed to, to be present here today. Uh, it is indeed um, uh, through an initiative that we started working uh, on the toolkit that was uh, supported and was uh, kindly kind of acknowledged uh, by the Danish uh, colleagues and uh, we were able to provide or to develop a global a global tool uh, uh, that came from a national or a regional uh, initiative, uh, so to speak. Um, so we have seen that the return counseling assistance has evolved over the years and the necessity, let's say, to develop uh, institutional guidance and operational tools um, has gained uh, a lot of importance. And um, we in the Western Balkans, let's say, have been on the forefront of this new developments given the mixed migration flows that we have been facing over the years. And while many resources to guide the reintegration process already exist, um, there was no institutional guidance on pre-departure counseling uh, that was available. That was available, and practices have essentially, let's say, been developed at country and mission level, uh, driven by local knowledge and experience, which is in essence um, uh, uh, totally agreeable and uh, and contextually right because every context has its own uh, particularities. But there was a need to standardize and to ensure consistency in service delivery and also to learn and make the learning uh, central to it. Um, that's why today we have with us uh, counselors not only from the countries of the departure but also the countries of origin because as Rose uh, mentioned, uh, you know, return doesn't, uh, doesn't stop or doesn't end at departure. Uh, the counseling uh, lasts throughout the process of return and, and reintegration. Uh, so you see that the return counseling toolkit uh, has six main uh, areas of work and uh, the conceptualizing return, the understanding the context in which we operate, uh, the method that we use uh, for counseling, which is very important, and that's where I thought about the standardization and the consistency. Um, and also the fact that we made uh, protection central, a central element in this, uh, in this toolkit, um, uh, working around the, uh, the agency of the migrant. And 
because we see that, uh, you know, how do we need to be aware that uh, the migrant agency is an important element, but how you make that uh, work in practice. So we need to be able to work uh, along those uh, vulnerabilities, addressing them and uh, understanding them in the context of the return process, which has many faces. So delivering return counseling in different settings, it's very important. And uh, you will see uh, how this will be further um, kind of described uh, by my colleague afterwards. And of course, uh, uh, the element of uh, working with children, which is very important. That's why we partnered with uh, other organizations who have specific expertise in this, in this area of working with children. So we paired our um, expertise in working on return and, uh, and prepare the specific uh, annex of the counseling toolkit that has that deals only with uh, counseling uh, of children and their families in the return process. Um, an essential component of the return process, of course, uh, as I said, it's the, the provision of counseling and to enhance the agency and to enable individuals to make an informed decision uh, for the future and their migration pathway. And as also Myro said, it builds upon you know, information provision, but that's only the beginning. So it really needs to be tailored to each migrant specific situation. And we as practitioners and my colleagues in the field as practitioners, indeed have that kind of exposure that each situation is indeed very specific and requires a very tailored approach, which in a way we realize the need for having a case management approach in the toolkit. And this is where we, we kind of uh, aimed at, uh, at um, perfecting this, uh, this toolkit in that direction. Um, and of course, uh, empowering the migrants in making the right decision and also not only the right decision, but uh, in case they, you know, in the issue of in, in issue of readmission situations and other elements that are not necessarily, uh, you know, voluntary as such, they can still uh, decide uh, what's best for them and among the different opportunities, choose the one and work on the opportunity and the decision uh, before they start uh, their journey home. Uh, and uh, the element of protection is uh, the something that we have really tried to make central, make central throughout this, uh, this uh, document. Uh, how do we do that? How do we work with uh, specifically individual uh, vulnerabilities and vulnerable individuals. Uh, you know, we have the standard vulnerability screens, uh, tools and forms that we have used over the years. So we try to adapt those and, and really um, make sure that they ad are adapted to the local context. Uh, what is the local context? I mean, we have seen over the preparation of this uh, toolkit that uh, many of our counselors work in very diverse environments. We have a European environment of counseling, which is very different from the ones that we have in, in, uh, in the Western Balkans than the one maybe there are in the, in the other continents. Um, so for what has, let's say, uh, began as a, as, a, um, as a local or as a regional uh, tool and a, reason, and a regional initiative, we realize that uh, it has its utility globally. But uh, it doesn't, it cannot not uh, address the issue of uh, being tailored to the specific needs of each, uh, of each setting and each context. Um, and uh, the issue of vulnerability screening, uh, you know, when we talk about standardization and also consistency is not one off and uh, should be reassessed uh, as necessary, as often as necessary, and also throughout the return uh, process. Uh, this is where the case management element comes in and the approach and the methodology and the method that we used and had in mind when we were uh, producing this was uh, the central element of it. Um, any vulnerability uh, it, it needs to be considered throughout the process. And uh, the information that we come across during the counseling 
needs to be understood in the context of vulnerability and, uh, and analyzed and also uh, referred uh, uh, due in due process in, in due time. Uh, the issue of confidentiality and privacy is something that, of course, uh, it's promoted and uh, it's well uh, important, but I think my colleague uh, Alexander will explain how that may be a challenge in the context specifically of the Western Balkans. Um, so to go back to the to our region, I introduced these pictures from our uh, library on purpose uh, so that you can see what kind of settings uh, we have and what kind of context we are facing in uh, providing uh, counseling and uh, outreach first and then also information provision but also counseling. So it's a challenging environment and the element of privacy as it uh, said previously in the in one of the main kind of uh, uh, issues is very difficult and we we know that the migrants in groups are very reluctant to uh, voice their plans or needs or or thinking there's peer pressure there's a lot of other uh, dynamics going on so um, the consistency in, uh, uh, in making sure that uh, people are informed and we also, what we also have noticed is that the route-based approach that we have and the consistency of the messaging that is provided from the entry point to uh, the endpoint in Bosnia-Herzegovina is a very important element. So gradually people can, you know, accept uh, this information, metabolize it and eventually reach and a maturity of making their decision at some point during the journey. Um, so you can see the four main standards that uh, we have taken uh, into consideration when, when working on, on the toolkit. Uh, so of course we are working with people who have been exposed to trauma, have been exposed to violence, risk, uh, brutality very often. So this needs to be uh, very central in our approach. Uh, we need to be able to refer um, and provide migrants uh, with key services um, uh, in, in relation to their vulnerabilities. And we don't work alone in that. So there's a variety and a plethora of organizations and government uh, settings that uh, can provide that. So it's very important, the network that we build and uh, foster in the uh, counseling uh, process. And then, uh, of course, share uh, this information about available, available, uh, available uh, services in the countries of return, um, because that is where our network, IOM network of counselors in countries of origin is becomes uh, key. And we have taken a lot of steps, uh, which includes also online counseling and virtual counseling, so that before the return, our uh, co co colleagues in the countries of origin are able to already establish a connection with the returning migrant, provide up-to-date information firsthand from the context in which they are sitting and make sure that the, the migrants can have the most uh, up-to-date information about their returning decision-making process. And of course, work in cooperation with governments because that's uh, the uh, host governments, the uh, member states, but also they have, they are the duty bearer at the end of the day. So their responsibility for the welfare of the, the people on their territory is of the government. So we are very uh, aware of the importance of making sure that the right approach, uh, protection sensitive approach is uh, embedded in our procedures, but also in the procedures of the government and uh, civil society organization. One last slide is uh, this map that uh, we show you here with the blue dots. And you can see where counseling is taking place in the Western Balkans. You see how many locations there are and how widespread uh, the, the work is. And it, that means that at every given time, th there are counselors working not only in, uh, in uh, reception centers, but also, as you saw, on the road, in uh, very remote areas, in areas next to borders, uh, in areas where migrants are exposed to traffickers or smugglers. So it's a very demanding outreach uh, and counseling uh, approach, which is make it different from, let's say, 
context, maybe in EU member states or in other areas that uh, we have, we are used to or have been used to working in as an organization. So this will be from my side, and I take the opportunity to now um, present you uh, my colleague uh, who works in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina in Sarajevo. Alexander um, is a uh, migrant protection and AVR counselor working in IR mission in Bosnia, Herzegovina, under a regional, of course, VB uh, Berson Balkan AVR program. Uh, he has joined uh, some time ago. He's uh, now on his fifth year already. He has grown, I would say, with us and with our program and has gained um, significant expertise and experience in the field of protection and migrant assistance. And um, I'm very proud that he's here speaking on our behalf today. And uh, as you know, like as you can see here, he's also a certified trainer for delivering employability skills to VOT. So Alexander, please uh, take the floor and um, uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Donatella, for such a kind introduction. Uh, I, will, I will use the opportunity to greet all the colleagues here. I'm very happy to, to be here today, especially as this uh, really uh, is a, a huge milestone, not only for us, but for um, r and r and r globally. Um, I think um, that this, um, this, this talk it will, is providing a significant value for the future and for the present. So I will just um, take a few minutes of your time to uh, go through uh, our field experience with testing the, the, the toolkit and uh, what, what, what were the developments and how we managed to get, to get the best practice, uh, best practice from the Western Balkans. So um, I can say that um, we, we really tried to, from the start of development of the toolkit, to address uh, vulnerabil vulnerabilities of the beneficiaries as a core and as well to have a migrant uh, centered approach at all times. So when we were testing the toolkit, uh, we wanted to use uh, the, 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 the document, the toolkit in a full scale, um, like we had no previous working experience. Uh, and what was very successful within the toolkit is that we managed to come from first step to last step with no um, difficulties because the, this, document, uh, this document really presents uh, a, a core document with, which covers all the, uh, we can say needs of uh, one uh, who is providing counseling to, to, to a beneficiary, to a migrant, in any particular setting. Um, protection and vulnerability screening needs assessment. Uh, vulnerability assessment as well uh, are, again, at the core of the rights-based uh, approach of the migrants who should facilitate and who we are as well facilitating to use and assess um, their agency. Um, at the core, really, what we were trying to do at all occasions was do no harm principle, which is highlighted through the toolkit at all occasions. And uh, we can say that the whole return counseling methodology laid out in the toolkit is, uh, is, is uh, very, very uh, intuitive, very easy to use, and uh, it, it really brings a uh, huge, huge value, value for, the, for, the, for, the, for the future. Um, I can say that because uh, r and r and delivering uh, counseling is, is is a bit challenging especially because those information that needs to be need to be shared with the beneficiaries during the counseling session um, they must uh, be in a very trustful manner uh, very disclosed and it is important to ensure confidentiality and uh, physical and virtual spaces must always be uh, safe for our for our beneficiaries um, so they can receive proper counseling and of course to apply the do no harm principle. What was um, uh, really useful during uh, our testing was the, we can say, especially delivering uh, counseling in detention uh, facilities, uh, which as well is quite quite highlighted uh, nicely in the toolkit, especially in a form of a challenge and proposed solution, um, which as well is a part of the feedback which uh, um, Jamaica and uh, Kiara and all the other involved um, colleagues received during during uh, the work which, which was um, um, uh, put through to, to create uh, the toolkit. Mm. <clears throat> what is particularly important is that we managed to allow all the stakeholders uh, who are involved in the uh, return process um, to get a better understanding on the r and r, &R policy as well as what an assistant dignified uh, voluntary return and reintegration program should include. 
uh, still keeping the safety and the uh, uh, confidentiality and protection of our beneficiaries uh, at heart. Um, we are trying to empower migrants in this way uh, to really step forward and take ownership uh, through all the phases of the return process and um, enable them to make a, 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 an informed decision uh, on how to proceed with, with, with their return. Um, <clears throat> as well, uh, it is very uh, good to mention that um, the toolkit lays out uh, various uh, uh, challenges which can occur, uh, let's say, uh, for a migrant who is returning with a condition, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, I will not take much more of um, your time. Uh, thank you for thank you for the opportunity to share my experience. And uh, later, of course, Sean has some questions. Uh, I will be open to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donatella and Alex, for for your intervention, for the comprehensive description of the rationale behind the toolkit, and also for the examples you brought from the region. Indeed, it is important to show the practicality and usefulness of the tool for all those operating in the in this area of work. So we move now to another aspect, not addressed yet, of the toolkit, which is the forthcoming module on children. This module is conceived as an integral part of the toolkit, but it can also be used as a standalone tool. It is a collaborative effort between IUM, UNICEF, and Save the Children to promote a rights-based return counseling to children and families. Bogdan will tell us more about this. Bogdan is the program director of the Balkans Migration and Displacement Hub at Save the Children. Over to you, Bogdan. The floor is yours. Thank you, Francesco. And, um... Thank you, especially to IOM for partnering with Save the Children and developing the module um, that concerns children. Um, it's been really a couple of months of really hard work, but we're happy to have the module finalized and ready to be ready to be implemented. Um, for Save the Children, in the, during the development of this uh, module, the most important thing was to ensure that. Um, the module really reflects uh, meaningful and ethical um, children's participation in the process. And we are happy that uh, it was developed here in the Balkans um, through the support of the Balkans Migration Displacement Hub of Save the Children. Um, we operate from Belgrade, Serbia, but uh, we focus on knowledge management, advocacy and partnerships. And uh, we think that uh, this experience that the hub has gained over the years, especially in the recent times with the increasing uh, refugee and migrant flows has been very important to uh, support IOM in creating the, uh, the module. Uh, as you know, child participation is an ongoing process which includes information sharing and dialogue between children and adults based on mutual respect and which children can learn how their views and those of um, adults and taken into account and shape the outcome of such processes. This is, uh, as said by the Committee of the Rights of the Child in the General Comment uh, 12. And if we look at how can we ensure uh, meaningful and ethical participation of children, uh, we should focus on uh, nine, main, uh, uh, nine main areas. Um, in practical terms, what does it mean? It means that if we uh, want to ensure that uh, the process is transparent and informative, it should ensure that children clearly understand um, their rights to express their views and that they will be heard and valued. Uh, children know why they're involved in a given project uh, or activity and uh, thus their participation will help to achieve uh, the types and decisions and plans that their participation will influence. How do you ensure this in uh, practice? How do you know if, if there was a checklist, uh, you would say that it means to provide child-friendly information in appropriate and accessible language or formats and to define the roles and responsibilities, opportunities and limitations. When it comes to the process being voluntary, children should clearly understand the implications of their choices and should be free to make decisions to participate or not to participate accordingly. Um, in practical terms, again, this means that children, we should ensure that children have time to make an informed decision about their involvement and to ensure that children can withdraw at any time. Addressing uh, 
adult and child power imbalances to ensure a truly voluntary process is also very important. The process needs to be respectful. So children's views need to be treated with respect by uh, adults, but also by other children. And staff have needs to have created a culture in organization that enables children to initiate any ideas themselves and express their views without feeling that they must uh, first seek permission from an adult. Uh, this means that we need to take into account uh, children's other commitments and rights and to ensure ways of working are culture and gender sensitive. The key adults need to be supportive and informed, and this includes also parents and teachers in any process. Uh, the process needs to be relevant, which means that children should be able to contribute uh, their expertise and draw upon their experiences, knowledge and capabilities to express uh, their views on issues of relevance and importance to their lives and to have relevant information provided uh, and to be accessible to children. This means that we need to ensure the issues are of real, real relevance to children and to support uh, any um, child defined topics and to ensure that adults have not pressured children. The process needs to be child friendly and this means that children need to feel welcomed. In practical terms again, staff needs to be approachable and responsive to children. Working methods should not discriminate children but take into account their evolving capacities, age, diversity and capabilities. This means that we need to use child-friendly methods and approaches and to ensure that, uh, we're meeting, uh, that the meeting places are child-friendly and accessible. The process also needs to be inclusive, which means that recognizing the children, uh, we need to recognize that children do not all belong to one group. Participation promotes, of course, inclusiveness and treats each child as an individual. Uh, no child should be discriminated against during uh, the participation in the process. Then when it comes to training, we need to ensure that staff and partners have the confidence and skills to facilitate any child participation process. And we need to show that we are safe and sensitive to risk, which means that children should know that all considerations in relation to their safety and protection from harm have been taken into account. Staff need to have a responsibility towards the children with whom they work, which means to undertake um, conflict sensitivity and risk assessments to develop a child safeguarding plan and to ensure that all children know where to go if help is needed, if further help is needed. Finally, we need to be accountable, which means that children receive feedback on how their contribution has advised, informed, or influenced uh, any developments to date. This can be done through developing a monitoring and evaluation strategy. We can include or should include children in such processes. We need to define communication and follow up mechanisms with children. And we need to ensure that children see the results of their participation. So this is, I think, this should be really helpful to all those who will be implementing the module in practice. We are looking forward to working with um, IOM in the future and developing also the different training modules. And also the module is not set in stone. It's a, it's a thing that can be developed based on the feedback from the ground. So we're looking forward to hearing comments from all of the colleagues who will be using it in practice. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you Bogdan for guiding us through this upcoming tool and also for the considerations uh, taken into the development process. I would like to add that the tool, I also saw these questions coming through the chat. Um, the tool will be uh, available in the coming weeks and then disseminated also through the return and reintegration platform. So as mentioned, Save the Children and UNICEF collaborated with IUM on the development on this module. And now we are very glad to have today with us Verena Naus, UNICEF Global Lead of Migration Development. Verena, she's been supporting countries' operation, leading on policy development and advocacy uh, partnerships. And she has also a, an extensive knowledge of the Balkans region. So Verena, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Francesco. I hope you, you can hear me and see me. Very um, well. Wonderful. Well, it's very hard to come after, after Roslyn, after Donatella, after Bogdan, after all these excellent speakers before us. Um, what I thought I can do maybe most usefully is to build on what has been said and maybe spare you um, more details on what is in the tool because we want to you know, maintain a little bit of suspense to get you actually to open, download um, and use the tools. But what I really wanted to do, and maybe we can move to the next slide already, is to thank you, to ground the discussion for a moment back on, on what this tool is for and who it is for. And as we have heard just before, the importance of, first of all, recognizing children as, as rights holders, just purely with their own needs and not just as the luggage of their parents when they are returning, for example, in a family unit. Um, doing so means that you need to find a way and to support and capacitate the return counselors to actually know how to comfortably engage with children how to talk with them, how to identify what has been said before, their resilience factors, to identify their aspirations, their hopes, their needs, and also to identify potential child protection flags that would need to be referred um, in some cases. And to do this, of course, across the age range, from the very small to all the way up to adolescents, um, who have very different, fundamentally different needs and ideas for the future. And all of them in one way or another need to be addressed, engaged and supported through and with the important work that return counselors can play. So when we're saying we want re reintegration and we want to support return counselors to help us deliver child sensitive and child centered reintegration, putting children really at the center of what we do has been key. And here I want to thank our close partners, IOM, I want to thank also Save the Children for the excellent cooperation that has led to us coming together to actually produce these tools and to specifically dive deeper into what is the role of return counselors when it comes to children. Now, if we move on to the next slide, um, I want to also uh, just highlight, we have a lot, we have heard already a lot of details, a lot of important aspects. Um, it was really inspiring to hear about the great work of the wide network of return counselors in the Balkans. Um, but really, what do return counselors do? Let's just step back for a moment. And probably many of us have been on vacation this summer. We've been running lists of things to pack for our kids, what not to forget, the diapers, the book, the phone charger, um, whatever it may have been. Because what we need to do when children travel including when they return, is to pack their rucksack with the things that they need to be safe, to feel well, to be protected, and to be able to just kickstart their life and continue their life um, in the best possible way. So in my mind, I always have that image of uh, what I once was told by a very, very hardworking, dedicated Swedish um, migration official who was explaining the Swedish approach to reintegration and return, including the important work of return counselors, as packing the rucksack of children and putting into that rucksack safety, the right information for them to make the right decisions, a feeling and a sense of dignity being recognized for who they are, for their wishes, a sense of ownership of their own destiny, but also packing into that rucksack portable skills and the certification that they need, the documents they need, um, and really working through and with those children, including children in families who are with their parents, working through what child-specific reintegration planning and support should entail and needs to entail to support that one individual child. So that image of a rucksack, I think, is what I would like to just reinforce as we are thinking about how to use the tools going forward and also recognize the critical and the important work of return counselors, as we have already heard before. But if we could move on to the next slide, there is a second very important um, point that I would like to just highlight here, or several points, in fact. Um, we would like you all to look at these tools and use these tools 
And, and obviously you will need to help us to improve them in the future and to adapt and socialize and contextualize them to the different contexts where they get used. But there's a few key considerations that need to be top of our mind. First is really that recognition that children are not just their parents' extension, that we need to think of providing return counseling support to all children those who are moving and returning on their own, as well as those with families. And that means finding and engaging them as part of the return counseling procedure, which is why those tools are so important and we were so happy to work with partners on them. Secondly, um, we really need to, in the return counseling work, um, capacitate the return counselors, and we hope these tools can move us a step forward on that task so that everyone feels comfortable engaging children and engaging parents and engaging legal guardians in the case of unaccompanied children in the most meaningful, dignified and ethical way. And in the most productive way so that you can identify those resilience factors and aspirations and plans and support needs. Um, so that return really isn't an end point, but reintegration is just another step on a child's journey towards adulthood and towards a fulfilling life. Another really important point, and this is sort of an appeal to us all as we are here in the room, many of us are really in the thick of it. We are either working on reintegration, we are practitioners, you are experts, but there is still sometimes a sense that return counseling is a nice to have. It really is a must have for child-centered, for sustainable reintegration. The role of return counselors is key. It is that glue, it is that piece that actually enables us to identify what a child needs and what needs to be packed in that rucksack. So it is really critical that those tools get used and applied and that the important role and work of return counselors is not just recognized, but supported. And then obviously the last consideration that is just critical from our perspective is that Focusing on children and doing return counseling in a way that works for children and, en and engages and empowers and supports them isn't just, again, a nice to have. It is at the center of sustainable re reintegration. I once, the other day, I, I was told by a colleague of mine that a parent's happiness is defined by how unhappy the unhappiest child in the family is. And we can all imagine that feeling if there is something wrong with your child in the, in the family your happiness is affected, your parental capacity to reintegrate is affected. So getting it right for children is the key for getting it right for parents, is the key for getting it right for a community overall. And that means really that with these tools, we hope practitioners and governments that are designing national reintegration tools and standards and guidelines, that you can find in those tools what you need in order to design return counseling to be child rights sensitive, protection sensitive and safe, to design the right training needs for the staff involved so that they can deliver those trauma-informed and protection sensitive counseling support, that data protection confidentiality is all upheld, that children are meaningfully engaged across different age groups, and that we have those referral pathways so that the work of return counselors is really plugged into a national system. And if we could move on to the next slide, this is my last important point. Um, return counseling and reintegration support to be itself sustainable really needs to be part of a national system of community support, child-centered services. And so really embedding the return counseling and strengthening capacities and building and strengthening those you know, system-wide support mechanisms that are available for children that are returning and reintegrating, this is the number one investment need that we need to together keep on working. Because the return counselor doesn't sit alone. And we saw the pictures before of the busy places, the library, the centers. Nobody sits in a vacuum. The return counselors need to rely on a system and need to be connected to a system where they can refer children where they can link up and support and get information from education, from protection systems, where they can work across borders, where they can confidentially share information, where there can be follow-up mechanisms. So building that ecosystem of actors, of systems and partners, where the return counselor can play his or her role 
using these tools and others available. This is really the future that we need to invest in. So my last slide, if you could move on, is really a small um, discussion starter as we're opening up for hearing from you and answering and receiving your questions. Tools are only as good as they get actually used. And so really important, we would like all of us here now collectively to use those tools and to use them in the best possible way, also to help us strengthen data and monitoring systems so that the return counseling work can be improved as we move along. That we are using these tools to guide us also where and how we can strengthen capacities of the people that are behind the work. The individuals, the men and the women and the young pro professionals that are delivering the return counseling so that they are capacitated to use the tools, apply the tools, and that they can do their work in the best possible way. Linking into a wider ecosystem where they can work with social workers, case managers, teachers, health professionals, and with the migration management system in the country. Also, we hope that the tools can be used for all of us collectively to continue identifying where there are maybe remaining gaps in the system, where children fall through the cracks, so that we can build those bridges um, and close them and return counseling, including the follow-up that we need, plays a critical role to help us identify not just individual needs of children and their own plans for reintegrating, but also gaps in the system. And last but not least, return counselors know this to, you know, in their sleep. Um, we can get some of the best information from listening to children and learning from them themselves. They are not just our customers. They are the end users of our tools. So if we hear back from them that they find these tools and their rollout, their use, helpful and beneficial, then we're on the right track. But in order to make sure we can keep finding out that we're using them in the best possible way and that we've delivered what they really needed the most, this is why it's so important to continue engaging and listening and learning and working with children as partners. So with this, I hope that I provided enough food for thought for discussion. The tools really are not just excellent for practitioners. I think they're also very helpful for the wider community of partners that are thinking how to design return and reintegration approaches in a most child-friendly way, in a child-centered way. So please use them and help us improve them going forward and take them to the road and take them to the corners, the offices, the libraries, the busy places where we hope they come to life. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you so much, Verena, for bringing your energy to our conversation, to bringing also the considerations of the protections of children returnees, the value of the importance of partnerships, uh, as well as the different steps on tools development and, and use. And talking about tools, I take advantage of this occasion to inform you all that a set of tools, indeed, jointly developed by IUM and UNICEF, which are complementary to the module on children of the reintegration handbook, will be released in the coming days. So we will make sure to reach you through the channels of the return and reintegration platform. Having said this, we have reached the last session of this webinar. We can move now to the question and answers. I leave the floor to Jamaica Scopa from the IEM Regional Office Vienna, who will moderate this interactive session. Over to you, Jamaica. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you very much. And thank you, first of all, to all the participants. I'm really glad to see such high interest and participation today. Thanks once again to the colleagues from the Knowledge Management app to support for the organization of this webinar and all uh, their enthusiasm and their work done so far, as well as all the panelists that speak today and their valuable contribution, not only to the discussion today, but really to the development of the toolkit and the additional model on counseling children and their families. So we are a little bit running out of time, but I have seen so many questions in the chat. Thank you, colleagues uh, and participants to be so active. So I will maybe start addressing uh, uh, one interesting one to Donatella. Uh, you explained that uh, the toolkit has been, uh, let's say, developed in the context of the Western Balkans, but it, of course, 
it can also address uh, the needs of the return counselor working globally. Could you please maybe explain uh, how it's easy to the, adapt the, the toolkit to other contexts uh, and a little bit more about the context uh, of the Western Balkans and why it was so needed such a toolkit? Thank you, over to you. Thank you, Jamaica. Thank you for this question. <clears throat> um, I will start with maybe picking up where Verena left about uh, making sure that we embed the counseling uh, skills and uh, ability to respond into a national structure, uh, which is very central to the reasons why we started working on the toolkit. Uh, namely, IOM has started a capacity development uh, effort in the Western Balkans in the 2017 on uh, AVRR, where we have uh, uh, worked closely with the government of the Western Balkans in embedding the structures for assisted voluntary return to be recognized by their national uh, legal and policy framework. So the work on the on the toolkit became kind of a, a normal or a logical um, continuation of the engagement that we had uh, already reached with the with the outreach, with information provision, with the operational aspect of return, and now reintegration as well as counseling. So we have worked closely with the, the institutions that are uh, involved in uh, in uh, in returns in in the national uh, kind of administration or governance, migration governance in the Western Balkans. Not each one equally, but there are, of course, differences in uh, capacities and, and also the responsibilities. But that's definitely something that we uh, have uh, taken uh, in, in the consideration. The context has also proven to be very complex and challenging, and I'll explain why. Uh, the vulnerabilities of the migrants are not visible. Uh, not all of them are visible. So you can see quickly a, a vulnerability if there is an underaged uh, person or a child uh, traveling alone or if somebody is, has physical injuries, but the other vulnerabilities are not necessarily so easily spotted. So the counseling and the ability to screen for vulnerabilities has become very important in the Balkans. Also because the speed of which and by which the migrants move across the Balkans is very different from the context that we have in, the, uh, in, in Western Europe where uh, the migrants or the asylum seekers are in a context where they are waiting for their decision, whether it's going to be positive or negative. So you have years uh, of counseling ahead of you and they have a quite long time ahead of them to make their decision. Here, our context is not like that. Uh, migrants sometimes uh, spend days, sometimes spend months, but sometimes spend a matter of hours. So it's very important how you deliver the information, how able you are to uh, provide consistent, reliable, and very uh, acceptable information to usable information to the migrants, um, and capture their attention uh, in this in this quick uh, turnaround that they that they have. So that will be my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donatella. Thank you very much. Uh, as always, you are clear and loud and. Uh, really uh, into the context. So thank you very much for this. Uh, following uh, your question, I think that maybe Alex is uh, uh, the best person uh, place to reply to this other question on how migrants exposed to the toolkit during, for example, the field testing that we did in the Western Balkans reacted to the toolkit. And also I, um, include another second question about uh, the challenges. Uh, so uh, Khaled is asking, what are the main challenges that an IUM return counselor face when working in the ground? Over to you, Alex, thanks. Uh, thank you, Jamaica. Um, so I, I can say that uh, the majority of uh, our beneficiaries, migrants responded very well. To the, to the toolkit because we were trying from the very beginning of the testing phase to uh, implement the methodology of the toolkit uh, to, to the full extent. Uh, we noticed that um, uh, really the, the migrants um, took the opportunity and took more ownership of their return, uh, return process. As well, we can say that uh, they really engaged with us more. They felt uh, more open to us, uh, especially that is important to us counselors, uh, which enables us to 
um, in the aftermath of, of course, to, to assess vulnerabilities, which initially were not visible to us on the initial counseling session or the follow-up counseling session. And uh, on these, we can actually see if there are potential um, uh, signs uh, that a person could be uh, a victim of trafficking and et cetera. Uh, as well, um, I think that we uh, raised their awareness level of their migration options. Uh, and I really think that um, that um, the beneficiaries got the sense that they can really assess their rights within within the agency. Uh, regarding the challenges, um, each uh, counseling setting has a different set of challenges. So, uh, but um, we, we can say that um, usually it's their hidden, let's say, vulnerabilities because they spend a lot of time out of their country of origin. Uh, they are exposed to uh, a lot of trauma, let's say, for in, in, in their migration journey, which is not um, simple at times. It can be very challenging for the migrants, all, all the border crossings um, and situations. So um, I think that the biggest challenge is uh, the, to establish uh, trust. And once the trust is established, I think that uh, then we can actually uh, really assess their needs and vulnerabilities and uh, support their, their, their return and reintegration process to a full extent. I hope uh, my answer uh, filled, filled the question. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much for this uh, first-hand experience. It's really important, and the toolkit actually aims to, to provide this, uh, a bottom-up uh, approach to return counseling, and it's important that it has been uh, uh, piloted and field-tested. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe uh, we have a last question for Verena regarding children and the model on uh, uh, return counseling children and families. Uh, since Bogdana from Save the Children, unfortunately, has to leave a little bit earlier, um, participants are asking, what are the red flags that return counselors should be able uh, to detect during counseling and how they should refer it? So maybe uh, you can also speak about partnership that are possible uh, uh, in this regard, depending, of course, on the national context. Of course, there are always different actors uh, working with children. Thank you, Verena. Over to you. Thank you, Jamaica. I mean, uh, I, I don't claim to be comprehensive now, but I think really critically is uh, the basic question of identifying if if the child faces threats within the family, identifying any child protection risks. So sometimes a counselor um, in a conversation with a child may actually have indications that there may be um, violence, gender-based violence, or other forms of protection risks um, that the child may face even from their own parents. There may even be threats or risks related to, to trafficking that may need to be identified. Um, there may be risk related to mental health and psychosocial um, risks, aggravated, you know, suicidal um, ideations or other indications where um, alarm bells should go on um, on the side of a return counselor. So in order to be able to identify those types of child protection risks, um, first, return counselors would need to be trained on how to identify what are signs um, that should raise alarms. But really importantly, um, return counselors are not expected to then respond to the risks. They have their own profile of what they need to do. But in order for them to play that link between identifying child protection risks and making sure that that child gets help, they need to have clear referral pathways worked out. So any return counselor would need to know, okay, when I have as when I'm identifying a potential risk, who do I call? Where can I refer the child to? How do I link back into the national system? How can I be? Um, do I have the hotline? Do I have a direct access and, and you know link back to the national child protection system, caseworkers, social workers, the right people in the context that would need to come um, into action here? And I think that is a very good example to illustrate why we keep saying as UNICEF that embedding the important work of return counselors in a national system makes those referrals easier and makes the harmonization and the standardization of approaches easier. So long answer um, for a very important question. It is referrals, it is being trained 
and getting the right uh, tools and support to identify and then know how to respond to those risks. Thank you, Verena. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, Francesco, maybe I leave it to you since we are a little bit over the hour. I may be um, inform all the participants that if you want to uh, continue the discussion, we have the community of the reintegration, uh, return and reintegration platform to address the question that unfortunately we don't have the time to address now but uh, thank you so much to be so active uh, and for the interest uh, in the toolkit and the uh, module on children thank you very much thank you jamaica and all of you for remaining also beyond the plan time so as mentioned the conversation goes online please do not hesitate to register to the platform community and join the thematic group counseling the link will appear shortly in the chat. Under this thematic group, you will find a dedicated forum where you can share comments and experiences with us and where we will actually uh, address the questions that remain unaddressed, unfortunately, today. So just before leaving the session, if, it would be great if you could take a few seconds to respond to the polls that just appeared on your screen. As last information, I remind you that the recording of this webinar will be shortly available on the Returner Integration Platform. So we have reached the end of our conversation. We hope that the description of the toolkit triggered your interest. Please do not hesitate to contact us for more information on the tool. Once again, many thanks to all the speakers that join us today. Thanks also to colleagues in Vienna, Belgrade, Geneva that helped us on the organization and moderation of the webinar. On behalf of the Knowledge Management Hub, thank you everyone again, and I wish you a nice rest of the day. Goodbye, everyone.